Good afternoon. Um, the conference asked me to do a literature review about what's driving the AIDS epidemic among uh, gay men, MSM, in the United States. And so my talk will address three primary questions. The first is, can HIV prevention work? The second is, is it working out in, the, out in the community level? And the third level is, what can we do to make things better? The first question is easily answered, can it work? The answer is yes. There have been two important meta-analyses that have already been published to show that in randomized controlled trials, model HIV prevention programs reduce risk among gay men in very big ways. Um, and that these, these studies have already been published. And, and, give, and give large effect sizes. For example, they include a 60% increase in, in using condoms for unprotected, for, for anal sex and so on. The next question is, are these programs actually working out in the real world? To answer this question, we turn to measures of incidence, HIV incidence in, among um, um, Americans and, and men throughout the industrialized world. We conducted a, um, an analysis, a systematic review of incidence estimates for MSM in Western Europe, the United States, and Australia. Um, the field tends to um, use proxy measures for incidence. That's because incidence estimates are very difficult and expensive to generate, and that may be especially the case among gay men. So that you tend to see things in the literature about rising rates of unsafe sex, sexually transmitted infections, and so on. Um, the other problem with incidence estimates is that if you use any one estimate for a given city, it can't be generalized to a whole country. Um, nor can it even be generalized to that city because of sampling issues and on and on and on. So that by using all of the incidence literature across um, the industrialized countries, we hope to j miss or avoid many of the problems that are, um, emerge with proxy measures for incidence rates or a standalone measure of incidence. Our review using very stringent review criteria identified 20 different studies from 1995 to 2005, the Prost Proteus era in Western Europe, the United States, North America, and Australia that yielded in turn 65 annualized instance rates across this period. Um, and on the international side, the rates of instance in Australia, HIV instance in Australia, are significantly lower at 1.1% than we're seeing in the, uh, North America or Europe where those rates are about the same. The other interesting finding is that there were no increases or decreases in instance rates among MSM in the industrialized countries from 1995 to 2000. Rates are not going up or down. The weighted mean instance rate across all these countries is 2.5% a year. <laughs> Turning to the United States model, we looked at just the estimates for the United States on, in community-based samples, which were the lowest rate of HIV instance compared to HIV alternative test sites or STD samples, we, we, um, found, we um, calculated a mean instance rate of about 2.4% a year. The next thing we did was we wanted to find out what does 2.4% mean? Um, what does 2.4% in particular mean over long periods of time? So we, we, we did a, a thought experiment using a closed cohort of young gay men at the age of 18, none of whom were infected at 18, but calculated an instance rate of infection of 2.4% a year as these men moved in age from age 20 to age 40. What we, what we, the, rate, the model that we constructed yielded an estimate that at about age uh, 25, about 15% of the men were, would be HIV positive. By age 35, about a third. And by age 40, by age 40 about 41%. The reason that we used the age of 40 as our cut point is that AIDS was discovered a quarter of a century ago. These men would have had to have been, by definition, younger than 15 years of age. In addition, because we know that HIV instance rates were stable from 1995 to the present, the vast majority of their sexual lives would have been in the context of this background instance rate of about 2.4, 2.5%. Um, we, we were kind of horrified that our model yielded estimates that high, prevalence estimates that high, and accordingly, we went back and looked at the largest samples published by the CDC of prevalence rates among American men in the United States. The CDC just published in 2005 a very large prevalence study of five American cities of, of HIV of prevalence rates by age. What we find is that the model 
actually fits exactly what's going on in terms of HIV prevalence among gay men, at least in America's largest urban centers. So that this model that we are extrapolating based on the instance rates that culminates in an HIV prevalence rate of 40% at age 40 is not something that's a prediction of something that may happen one day. This is, we are describing epidemiological phenomena that are occurring all around us and will continue to occur among young American men if we do not find ways to lower HIV incidence rates further. The last part of the talk focuses on how we can do a better job of HIV prevention. And what I focus on are, are questions that gay men are asking about how to maintain sexual safety that are not being addressed by the proven programs that have yielded randomized control trial big effect sizes. Among these are, are precise definitions about what is sexual safety anymore, um, about maintenance of sexual safety over the long time, over the long haul, about issues of community viral load, a very in, um, important analysis by Greg Millett at the Centers for Disease Control showed, for example, among African American men that they are actually less risky than European American gay men and are less likely to use drugs. So if they're less risky and less likely to use drugs, where's all that virus coming from? Millett's answer in a, in a really wonderful analysis he did showed that the rate of unknown HIV seropositivity and, and, and lack of access to antiretroviral care among African-American men who know that they are positive is so high that you have a, a, a much higher prevalence rate of men who are viremic in the population, which we call community viral load. So that the context of men who are, who are finding whose, whose sexual access is limited by race, they, that, they're, that those sexual networks have such a high community viral load that even modest levels of sexual risk taking can result in very high transmission rates even though the men are doing the best they can to be sexually safe. So it's the context that matters with these guys, not their individual risk taking behavior. We also raise questions about, about the, the large investment that the United States has made in prevention science but the challenge of getting this into the field so that community-based organizations can actually put these things into the field. And, and, and the amount of funding that's going in to support HIV prevention in the United States, it's actually a rather small sliver of the entire budget. Um, Holtgrave and colleagues at, at Johns Hopkins that has shown that the amount that we're investing in HIV prevention only allows us to kind of run in place um, in, in terms of, of, of winning the fight in, in, in AIDS prevention in the United States. So to, to summarize what I've been able to show in the qualitative analysis is that there are multiple levels of prevention activity that are promoting risk among gay men, but that the interventions that we're using only operate at the level of the individual. They're not designed also to operate in terms of, of context like community viral load, in terms of, of funding for the, getting prevention projects into the field, in terms of policy, in terms of, of treatment for comorbid conditions, and on and on and on. Our, and because we're only operating at one level, as opposed to the multiple levels that are driving risk, it's analogous to using AZT to treat, uh, AZT monotherapy to treat HIV infection. You can get effect sizes for short periods of time, but you cannot expect big effects for long periods of time. And so I make an argument and provide a design for what I'm calling an HIV treatment cocktail. And what would, a treat, what would a pre, an HIV prevention cocktail, excuse me, what would a prevention cocktail look like and how would we get this into the field? Um, those are the, are the main points, um, but the, basically at the HIV instance rates that we're already seeing in the published literature, um, we can expect an ongoing HIV epidemic among gay men that will yield high prevalence rates over time. Um, and, that, and that we need to, and that the, the, the implications of this are so profound we have got to find a smarter way to do HIV prevention in our country. Um, operating only at the level of the individual may not be the smartest way to go. Thank you. Can we take some questions?